Okay, I think it's nine o'clock, we're going to start. There's no moderator, so I'm going to moderate, I think. So uh, I'm Mark Varley, I'm the CEO of Address Cloud. Um, speaking after me is going to be Sarah Hoffman, We're talking about uh, nominating and geocoding. And then after that, I think we've got some really interesting lightning talks as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to be speaking for the first kind of 20 minutes, then we're going to have some questions, a bit of time to people to move rooms, and then Sarah is going to be up at 9.30. Um, so I'm here today to talk about uh, aggregating risk with H3 and PostGIS. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background uh, around the company, what we do. Uh, I'm going to dive in a little bit into the detail. I've got a pre-recorded demo I'm going to show and then a uh, uh, kind of conclusion and questions at the end. Um, so in terms of what we do, uh, Address Cloud, we're a, a UK-based company. Uh, I like to say we were born at Phosphor G, so in 2013 I went to my first Phosphor G in Nottingham. I was really inspired like, by all the talks that uh, I, I saw and that gave me the idea to start a business. Uh, 2015 we, I went to Korea and I met, uh, well I met Dennis, but I also met my co-founder Thomas, uh, who's our, our CTO. And, um, uh, and on from there we've basically built the business up. So what we do is we provide a geocoding and a location intelligence service. Uh, the geocoding service is UK and Ireland specific, so we use government data from the UK and Ireland and we ingest that and we provide that back as a service, to, predominantly to insurance companies. And then we have a location intelligence platform which is all around, for a specific address, describing it and, uh, and providing a very, very fast uh, risk analysis of that property, uh, uh, specific property level. So, uh, as I say, it's our, our uh, infrastructure is completely serverless, so I've talked at Phosphor G a few times and, and, and evangelised about uh, serverless, and we live and breathe that. So in 2019, we moved our entire stack to be serverless running on AWS, on, uh, predominantly on Lambda. Uh, we now scale, uh, we do 50 million transactions a month, so we work with big insurance companies, smaller insurance companies, and we also work with, uh, have some government contracts as well. Um, so in terms of what I'm going to talk about here, to, I'm, I've actually stolen this. Somebody, uh, I saw a presentation yesterday where they put this quote up from Paul. I don't think Paul's here this year, but uh, we're big fans of Paul Ramsey. Like, all of his ideas are great. And, and this is really, this is something that we do. Really, to build something to scale, you need to kind of make it boring. So what I'm going to show you today, the actual back end, the actual final result is, is, is pretty interesting, but the architecture behind it is quite boring. And boring scales, boring scales really, really well. Um, so, as I say, really to date, so for the first kind of, you know, we've been running since 2015, so the first seven years of our existence have all, way, have all been around a specific niche, which is insurance, and specifically around optimising for, for one use case, which is find me an address really quickly and describe it, tell me stuff about it really quickly. So, to do that, we pre-cache everything, we pre-load everything, all of our geo-processing is all done uh, ahead of time rather than being done on the fly and that allows us to be able to scale really well so as I say for that 50 million transactions a month we have to be available 24 7 and we have to respond within half a second that's the SLA that we have with all of our customers if someone wants to get their insurance at 3 a.m. they have to be able to get that so that means finding an address and, and working out all of the things that would worry insurers so a few examples there and there's a lot of geography in insurance it's if you're looking for a really interesting place to apply your geo skills, insurance is a fantastic, uh, uh, really fantastic domain. So yeah, flooding, fire risk, subsidence risk, and crime being some of the key ones. These are all things that you can use geo for to, uh, uh, to understand it and provide insight to customers. And we do this down at specific property level. So if you've got 20 properties on a street, uh, maybe it's on a hill, for example, we'll differentiate. We'll say the property at the bottom near the river is a bad risk, the one at the top is fine. So we're doing this down to a very low, le low level of resolution, normally down to five meters. So in terms of, uh, of, of what we do, so today everything's been around single risk, but what we're looking at now is, uh, is another problem that all insurers face, which is making sure that they have a balanced portfolio. So what this means is bringing in a, a huge, a very large number of locations and being able to provide some insight back to that company very, very quickly. So really it's all around kind of hot spots. Do they have too much risk in one place? Um, and, and also, you know, how they might be able to manage and mitigate that risk. 
Uh, and again, geography is a huge factor. So, you know, we talked here about floods and quakes, but this would also be things like terror attacks and, and, and other things that could potentially mean, uh, uh, you know, huge losses for customers, but also for the custom, for the, for the uh, insurance company, it could be an event that could actually, uh, the, the company could actually fold. The, the, you know, the company might not be able to bear an event like that. Um, the biggest example of this was, uh, and, and really a lot of the work that we're doing today kind of got triggered really by the, by the, by the terror attacks, the 9-11 terror attacks. Uh, the company I was working for at the time was insuring through, like as a global insurance company, through a network of, uh, uh, of subsidiaries and, and, and localised companies, they insured both towers and all of the retail units around it. Uh, and when the building came down, it was, it, this is a 300 year old company, for the first kind of two or three weeks they didn't know whether or not the company was going to survive uh, uh, th that event. Uh, luckily they did through kind of fortuitous circumstances and reinsurance and things like that, they survived it, but they want to avoid doing that impossible, uh, doing this in future if possible. And that means being able to perform some of these calculations in advance before you go and insure all of these properties, basically do doing this in advance. So yeah, we're, this is something we're building at the moment. So this is kind of a, a, an early uh, insight, but it's like, can we basically, can we take our, our serverless ethos and all of the things that we do and extend that out to, instead of just looking at one property, looking at a huge number of properties, but with a similar architecture and being able to provide very quick uh, insight and very quick responses. Um, and yeah, can we do it at scale? So we've got kind of five requirements that we're going to go through here and then I'm going to show a quick demo uh, around how we propose to solve these. So yeah, we need to be able to visualise millions of locations. So the companies that we work with can have uh, very large portfolios. Um, so this thing needs to be able to support a, a very large number of locations. Um, we want to be able to filter, so we don't really want, we don't know what the cust necessarily the questions are that our, our, our customers, or our customers are normally the insurance underwriters uh, or the portfolio managers, they, we don't know what they're going to ask, so they need to be able to ask any question and, and be able to do that really quickly. Um, we also need to be able to aggregate, so uh, we're quite lucky in that most of what we're aggregating by are predefined shapes, um, but these could be anything from administrative boundaries, Cresta zones, which is something specific for insurance around earthquake risk, earthquake risk zones, um, fire blocks, floods, and, and buildings. So from right up here, right down to a low level of, uh, of, of detail. Um, we need to be able to do ad hoc as well. So in the event, like, uh, let's say we're uh, in a country that doesn't have any good administrative boundaries, we still want a, a means to be able to aggregate that data up as well. And finally, as well as everything, it needs to be really quick and it needs to be serverless. We, need, we have an SLA with our customers, so we need to be able to respond really quickly. So this is a, a really brief demo that I've put together, just showing um, what it is that, uh, kind of like how we're going to solve this. It's, it's pretty, pretty rough and ready, uh, but I'll play it and I'll explain. So basically what we're doing here is, um, uh, so everything we see here is the entire portfolio. So we start with a million locations. I want to look at Marks and Spencers, or I may want to look at Argos. These are two retailers in the UK. And you can see this is all happening. There's no smoke and mirrors. I'm able to basically go in there and, uh, and be able to perform queries really, really quickly and get that insight that's coming up straight away. And this is all using, uh, basically using some really, really simple tooling. So I'll just play that again because it's a little bit quick. Um, so we start with the full portfolio. So this is, this is the whole country, a million locations and a, a lot of money. And very quickly, almost instantaneously, we can get down to 600 locations, 477. This here is the distribution of flood scores. So we can see most places have no flooding. Uh, what will be more interesting is to kind of slice over here and look where some of the higher flood risk is. And again, once we go in, so the, the, we're, it's responding to both the interaction with the map and also uh, the interaction through the search bar here. So it's, doing, it's very, very quickly aggregated. I think here I'm probably using a, a hex zone that's maybe a little bit too small. Ideally, I'd use that a little bit bigger. But you can see that this and this are completely in sync with, with one another. Uh, and yeah, this loads really, really quickly. So all of this stuff is happening on the server. That's, that's why we can do it so quickly. So in terms of what we're using for that demo, so this, is just a, this was just something that was running locally on my machine that I, I coded on Sunday. Um, but basically we have React and Matt Libre on the front end. 
We've got Express.js, which is serving up our API. We're using Tile Server that's serving up our, uh, our vector tiles, and then this is all Postgres on the back end. But what we're doing really is that the Tile Server, so, we, so everything is being pre-cached, so we, we, we're creating all of our admin boundaries in Postgres and then cutting, uh, using Tiffy Canoe, cutting tiles to serve up here, so that's all pre-calculated. And then in terms of the actual data itself, we've got that million uh, insurance policies. We're actually pre-calculating uh, and pre-storing all of the zoom levels. So we're using the uh, H3 PG plugin uh, to show those hexes. But rather than doing it on the fly, we do it in advance. Uh, and I, I ran uh, uh, basically pre-storing everything at uh, pre-storing everything uh, uh, with, with all the tags for every zoom level. So to calculate every zoom level on a million locations in advance took 12 seconds with H3PG. It's really, really fast. And then after that, all you're having to do is, uh, is, is, is aggregate up tags. So there's no geo. All the geo has been done in advance. And then when you're running on the fly, you're, all you're doing is, is aggregating regular text. So it keeps things really, really simple. There's no geometries being passed to the client and back. All we're doing is passing regular JSON objects and then the, the client is doing the styling. So uh, one thing that we would probably do, uh, actually looking at yesterday, one thing we're not using at the moment is DEC. So the, for the H3 tiles, we've actually pre-calculated those ourselves. I went to the DEC talk yesterday, so I think we'll probably look at, at DEC here as well uh, as an as ability to be able to make this even better. Um, so yeah, basically what we're doing is we're pushing all of the complicated geologic to the server. We're doing it as part of our ETL, so as we bring on all of these policies, we are going out and we are tagging, we're doing all of that geo work in advance, so we've, everything's pre-cached and pre-calculated, and, and therefore very, very quick. Um, and as I mentioned, so Tippy Canoe we're using, we've, if you haven't used Tippy Canoe, it's great. I guess the only kind of drawback is that you have to go to GeoJSON first before you create your, your tiles. Um, that's slightly annoying, but it's a really, really fantastic piece of software that will one, run on even quite small servers. Um, the other thing as well is the H, so the limitation of what we've done here, which I think DEC will solve, is that when you start generating H3 tiles at lower levels of resolution, uh, the vector tile format becomes, you know, the, the vector tiles that you're creating become huge. Whereas I think DEC would solve that because DEC knows how to render H3 on the, on, in advance, but we can keep our back end the same. We're just passing through a, a bunch of different H3 uh, uh, attributes with some uh, information against it. Um, so, uh, and again, we're quite lucky in that our geometries are static. So, you know, buildings, uh, our buildings layer gets updated every six months. Our administrative boundaries maybe once a year. And obviously, uh, S3, uh, H3, uh, H3 uh, hexagons don't move. So all of this stuff we can do in advance and we don't make the client pay the penalty uh, in terms of performance. Everything is pre-cached pre -cached and pre-aggregated. And then what we're doing, so really it's the front end that's doing the work. So the front end needs to be fairly intelligent. It needs to understand what zoom level am I at, therefore what is the, the most uh, uh, applicable resolution of, of, of information I can show. And also when it gets, it, it's, it's orchestrating the queries to the client, it's passing through the, uh, the extent. And when it gets back, really I call this painting by numbers. So you've got a really, imagine you've got a really simple uh, uh, vector tiles canvas and the client is basically looking at all the information it's got back and it's painting up all of the different shapes on the screen and, that, and this is very, very quick. Uh, we're using expressions, um, but apparently if you use DeckGL, you can actually do this with JavaScript functions. So it's a little bit easier, a little bit more elegant, a little bit simpler. But really the idea is, is kind of trying to constrain. So when you're aggregating up millions of locations, Try and make it as simple as possible. So construct a query where might, you might get, I don't know, two or three hundred uh, tiles and then painting those up on the client makes this very, very quick. So uh, yeah, as we're in Florence, I, I, I found this up, so I'll leave this. I thought it was quite interesting. Um, but basically, that's, this is the concept. We're painting by numbers. So we're bringing uh, complicated data simplifying it down to a, a really simple uh, SQL query and then painting things up on the client to make it go really, really, really quick. Um, for those who like the code, this is the paint by numbers uh, function that I'm doing here. Uh, it's pretty simple, so I'm basically saying where, what, what zoom level am I at? Here I'm just using regular map lib. We're not using like uh, React map, uh, React 
React Map LibGL, which I think we would do in future. So some of this stuff uh, is a little bit, uh, you know, we're, we're basically instructing the, uh, the map what to do. But yeah, we're getting the zoom, we're working out the bounds. This is my back-end call. This is, this is calling to my API to be able to do the aggregation. So we're basically saying, within this bounding box, it's just a simple group by. Um, so group by order of the data, filter by the insured name on the flood score, and then bring that all back up as, a, uh, as an aggregation. Um, and then what we're doing here is we're setting up our match expressions. So if you've used match expressions, match expressions are basically arrays of arrays. It's like a map box notation, but it allows you to, so we're getting our ID. So that's saying, look uh, on the map for, for things with this ID, and that might be a hex, that could be a hex zone, that could be a admin boundary, it could be a building, could be anything. And then we're gonna iterate through all of our results to paint, uh, paint each thing up. And then we've got some, uh, some thing here with the colors, so it knows what colors to paint everything up. And then there's a fallback here saying, well, if there's a, a particular zone, like a hex zone or a building that we don't know anything about, then uh, give it like a regular uh, invisible, uh, uh, invisible paint, so don't paint anything. Uh, and yeah, this works really well, and it works, it works really quickly. So in terms of taking this into production, so what we said at the beginning is it needs to be fast and it needs to be serverless. Now, we, we know we can do it fast. Can we do it serverless? Uh, and yeah, we can. So basically, by doing everything in advance in Postgres, our, our Lambda function can be quite dumb. Uh, all it's really having to do is, uh, at the, the, I mean, the API that we've got is probably about 20 lines of code. It's just saying, okay, take information here and write and send some simple queries to Postgres to do group by. Um, I'm just going to do a quick plug for Thomas, our CTO. The other thing that we need to do is, you remember earlier in my previous example, we had Express and we had a Tile Server. Um, so what we're doing here, we're not using any Tile Server because the Tile Server will need a server to run it on. Or even our vector tile generation is being done completely serverlessly. Um, so Tom's doing a talk later, he's doing a lightning talk on how to render uh, vector tiles directly using API Gateway and Lambda with no, uh, no server, no backend, no nothing. It works really, really well. It scales up really well. And then, as I say, React to MapLib on the client, but we're probably going to go to deck. So to conclude, really, um, as I say, I, I said to you at the beginning, you know, to make this scale, uh, you need to make it boring. Uh, that means doing everything in advance. So do all of your, uh, everything as part of your ETL. If you know in advance the questions that your customers and your users are going to ask, then pre-render and pre-optimize for that. And that allows you to cache and, and do other cool things as well. Uh, pre-render your vector tiles. Um, so if you are able, if your geometries don't change, if they're not dynamic, if they're static, pre-render everything in the vector tiles is fantastic. And then using uh, this painting by numbers approach. So instead of having to pass geometries up to the client that have been pre-formatted, basically just uh, have your geometries, have your result query results, and let the client put those together and, and paint them up. And then that way you'll get really, really quick, really fast performance. Um, and yeah, that's everything. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I'm happy to ask any questions. I've got, if anyone wants an address cloud sticker, I've got some address cloud stickers. Um, but yeah, I'll open up the audience uh, to any questions. Thank you.